As I continue the introduction to quantitative risk, over the next several videos, I'll review linear regression, and I'll start with here the sample regression function. And the point is going to be to show that there is one population regression function from which we could generate multiple sample regression functions so that we can understand why the regression coefficients are random variables with their own properties. To understand the linear regression, the first step is to understand the theory of the sample regression function. And to do that, I'll use data from Stock and Watson Chapter 4, which is assigned in the FRM syllabus, and the size of the population is 420. As far as populations go, not an especially large population, but that's our population size. And then what we have are data on two variables for the population. We have student test scores. And so these are on something like the SAT, where the scores are 500, 600 or so. And we also have the other variable is the student-teacher ratio in the classroom. So these are values, for example, 15, 20, 25, the ratio of students per teacher in the classroom. So we'll look at the theory of the sample regression function. And then the next video, I'll drill down on how the ordinary least squared coefficients, those are the coefficients in the regression, how those are generated. But in this video, I have two ideas, right? A population regression function and a sample regression function. Here we have the population regression function. If we picked up the data or retrieved the data for the first time, the first step would be exploratory data analysis, probably. And we might generate something like we have here, which is my copy of Stock and Watson Table 4.1, a typical EDA, exploratory data analysis, where we have, you can see, one row for each variable, student-teacher ratio and test score. We have average standard deviation, our measure of dispersion, and then percentiles. So, for example, the student-teacher ratio, we can see here the median student-teacher ratio in this data is 19.7 or almost 20. And the median test score is 654.4. However, this just gives us summary statistics in each of the variables, but this gives us no information about the relationship between the variables. For that, we probably would do a scatter plot. So here we have the scatter plot, and with all 420 paired observations are plotted. I think of them as scatter points in the scatter plot here. And we have on the y axis here, the uh, test scores, and on the x-axis, the student-teacher ratios. And what I've done, you can see here, is I've asked Excel just to generate the regression line for me. So you can see we have an intercept of almost 700, and that just means if we drew this line out, we would intercept the y-axis at here at the intercept, but what we have here is, in practical terms, what oftentimes happen, we're going way out of sample here, and in practical terms, oftentimes the intercept has no economic significance. I think that's the case here, because this is telling us what the test score would be if the student-teacher ratio were zero. Zero students per teacher doesn't really make economic sense. This probably has no meaning for us. But the slope does. Right, it's telling us that for each one unit increase in the student teacher ratio, we are expecting here approximately a decrease of just about 2.3. I say decrease because it's a negative in the test score, so we have an inverse relationship. The direction of that probably matches our intuition. However, um, we're not yet ready to say. Uh, anything except visually about the goodness of fit of this line or the significance of these coefficients. That comes later. What we just have here is this negative relationship telling us the expected change here of the expected change in our uh, test score given a one unit change in the student teacher ratio. And what I really wanted to highlight here is that this is a population reg regression function, right? So I'll, I'm going to I'm going to signify that here, PRF, as the population regression function. 
and I'll use what I think are Stock and Watson's um, notation, because notations can vary. I'll say um, y sub i is the dependent variable that is equal to, and I'm going to use uh, beta sub zero for the intercept. I'm drawing a B because I'm not so good at drawing the Greek beta, but this is, could be beta sub zero or capital B sub zero for the intercept plus the slope beta sub one or uh, B, capital B sub one as the slope multiplied by X sub I, which I prefer to call the independent as it influences y sub i, the dependent. Stock and Watson use technical terms that I'm not so f crazy about because I always have a hard time remembering them. And they call the uh, x sub i here the regressor, and y sub i is the regressand. But I prefer independent influencing the dependent. And so you can see here we have our test scores are the dependent and the student teacher ratios are the independent. So that's the nature of our association. We can also say, uh, we can also say that we're regressing the test scores against the student teacher ratios. I think that's a very efficient way to say it. This is a regression of test scores against or on the student teacher ratio. And again, this is the population. So the idea with the population regression function is that if we have the whole population, right, we only have one population regression function. In practice, our population is usually unimaginably larger. And the idea is that it's so, there's so much, the, the population is so large that we can't actually get all that data. For example, if we were doing uh, data on the people in the United States, population in the United States, that number is over 300 million. So we would typically, we would conduct a sample um, from that population. So with this population regression function though, I've left off a key term here that we don't need to see because its expected value by construction is zero. And so I'm gonna denote that u sub i, pretty common. And that is our error term, also called the noise component. See, we don't need to see it here because by definition, it has important properties, or I should say by construction of the assumptions of the regression, its important properties include that its expected value is zero and that it is also not correlated to itself. But it plays a really important role because the idea with the error or noise component is that it contains all of the influences that are not included here in the independent variable, but that influence y. So these are the factors that influence the dependent that are not included in our independent variables or multiple independent variables. So you can see in a univariate regression where we have a single independent, that could be a lot of forces. And so it plays an important theoretical role and also by virtue of its assumptions, it plays an important role in the construction of those ordinary least squared coefficients that we'll look at later. But the, again, this is the single population regression function that um, draws a line through the single uh, population. So then we'll look at the sample regression function. And so to do that here in the upper right, I shrunk it down a little bit, but it's the same population and population regression function. And then what I'm doing here below is plotting two different sample regression functions, right? In blue and in orange. So here in blue, what I'm doing is I'm drawing 30 pairs from the population, only 30. I pick 30 because it's right on the border between a small and a large sample. Typically a large sample starts at 30. So we could call this almost small or almost large. And I really have 30 rows here, but as, as usual, I've collapsed them just to keep the screen manageable. So you can see I'm just showing one, two, skipping three to 28, and then I have 29 to 30. So I have 30 pairs of observations that are drawn as a random sample from the population. I did that in blue, and then I'm doing another one in orange. And then, as before, I asked Excel just to 
um, generate for me the linear regression line. And you can see my scatter plots are different as we expect because we're drawing a sample from the population and therefore so are my coefficients. I also have recruited Excel here below to generate for me the slope and intercept coefficients. So you can see how now in practice, you know, in practice, the population is so large we don't access it. So we draw samples, but the samples are really give us ra uh, random values from the population. So each of them is different. So if I rerun this, you can see each time I go back and draw samples of 30, because I have really an almost small sample. I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting really wild variability as I would expect with an almost small sample. Um, as this number increased, if I were to draw samples of 400 out of 420, I'd get both of them would be much closer to my population. Okay, so what I have here is the sample regression function and I actually have what the point I wanted to share is that I'm getting a different sample regression function each time. We have one population regression function, but we have many sample regression functions. And I'm even going to emphasize that by generating the sample regression function slightly differently. So it's still going to be the dependent y sub i, which is my test score, is still going to be equal to, but this time instead of capital B or beta, as beta sub zero as the intercept, I'm going to use small b sub zero. And, and this reflects the Stock and Watson notation. And it's why part of why notation uh, matters. I have small b sub zero for the intercept plus small b sub one for the slope multiplied by the intercept, I'm sorry, the independent, which is my uh, student teacher ratio. So it's otherwise similar except that I went from population parameters of which there are really only one set of values to uh, sample statistics as part of the sample regression function. And I'm even going to do that for the, what, what, is, what, what was the error or noise term, right? We had u sub i for the error term in the population regression function. But here in the sample regression function, I'm going to use e sub i to uh, indicate the residual. So the residual is an estimator of here the error or noise term in the population. Each of these coefficients, the intercept, the slope, and the residual are estimators that are different for each sample and they estimate the population parameters. So the key idea is that in this sample regression function, these coefficients themselves are random variables. You can see here below when I enlist Excel for help with the linear regression, in addition to my familiar regression coefficients, you can see here in my first sample, the intercept is 640 for my first sample, and in my second sample, it's 651. These um, estimators, are these coefficients that estimate the unknown population parameters are random variables. So almost always you'll notice in the, reg in the regression output that second row is the standard errors. And the standard errors are, as I like, as I oftentimes remind, are just standard deviations. But standard errors are standard deviations of sampling distributions. These coefficients here, the 640 and 651, are random variables. They have sampling distributions. The standard deviation of those sampling distributions are the standard errors. So you see how these are the random variables. And so now we have some information on their own dispersion with which to evaluate them. But the key idea here, again, was that each time we go back in practice, and draw a random sample, we get a different sample regression function with these coefficients that are technically estimators of the population parameters and therefore themselves random variables with properties and their own standard deviations. And so that's an introduction to the sample regression function. So 
will be better equipped really to evaluate the significance of these coefficients. But in the next video, we'll, I'll drill down on the construction of these ordinary least squared coefficients. Thank you.